by hand. I feel sorry for the professors who had to mark my assignments because my handwriting was not the best. It's good to be here. It's good to be back here. And to see uh, not the old faces, that's the mistake I made this morning, to say I see old faces, then I realize that I might be insulting people. To see familiar faces is the, right, the correct word. It's good to see everyone here. Um, I remember the faces, but some of the names have, have lost because when you move from one place to another, you cancel out all the, the names in your head uh, of the old place and you try and find and remember the new names and get to know the new names. So if I've forgotten your name, uh, please don't be offended. It's just that I'm in transition um, between here and, and, and wherever I am. I still don't know where I am at the moment. And so I find myself all over the place, and the church forget, forgets that they, they told me to retire. Uh, they keep calling me to do things like coming to Tura North instead of uh, me retiring and enjoying my time uh, as a retired person. So if I don't remember your name, please just accept that I have forgotten, um, but I, it's not for my disrespect of you. You still are the most an important person in my life. And you know, when you get old, you forget things. Like the old man who kept calling his wife, my darling, my lovey, my sweetheart, and everything else. And some young person went up to him and said, Sir, I so admire you. you you're so advanced in age with your wife, and you still call her your sweetheart, your darling. And he says, come here, my boy. Let me tell you, I forgot her name. <laughs> That's why I call, it, I call you sweetheart. So if I call you a sweetheart or brother, just know that I forgot your name. But uh, it has not reduced the value that you hold in our hearts. The call to worship. The Lord is here. In the name of Christ, we are welcomed into the presence of God. What is required of us but to do justice? How shall we be ready to kneel before our God? What is required of us 
but to love kindness. How shall we be worthy to kneel before our Lord? What is required of us but to walk humbly with our God? Teach us, Lord, how to be good to upon us, that we may dwell in your presence forever. We now join in singing the hymn, All for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, My Great Redeemer's Praise.
God's people say? Amen. Amen. Please be seated and let us pray. <coughs> Gracious God, your love extends to all your people, great and small, strong and weak, rich and poor. You call us to extend the same love to one another, to let go of our pride and to embrace the spirit of humility. You erase the gains of the proud, but reward the efforts of the lowly. You bring down rulers from their thrones, but you lift up the humble. Your son Jesus Christ declared that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Grant us a humble spirit, Lord, to wait upon you, to give us places to which we belong, not because we deserve them, but, we, but because we receive them by grace. Cleanse us from our pride, we pray, that we may enter into your presence. Your prophet told us that humble seekers of righteousness are welcome on your holy mountain. We do not claim to be humble, or worthy to be in your presence. But we approach you in the name of the one who emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, coming in human likeness and found in human appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Accept us, Lord, into your presence. And through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, teach us your will. Grant us the spirit of obedience and give us courage to live in accordance with your teaching, with his teaching and your will. The litany follows and the responses are printed in gold. Like those first disciples who climbed the mountain to be with Jesus, to hear him teach. We have come here to be taught by him. We come to him confessing our poverty in spirit, our faint and faltering faith, and our cold hearts, unable to love you and our sisters and brothers. We come to hear him declare blessings upon the meek, but we struggle to come down from our places of pride. Give us the spirit of Jesus, who will be in the very nation of God, teach us to pray and to advantage. We come to hear him declare blessings upon the peacemaker, for they shall be called the children of God. Give us the courage of Jesus, We come to hear him declare blessing upon those who are ridiculed, reviled, and persecuted on his account. Give us hope, joy, and gladness for our efforts to not be without reward. As your words reach our ears, let them also touch our hearts. We have come to be taught by the great teacher. Let us not reject his teaching. We 
bring our prayers of adoration and praise to God. Gracious God, you created us out of nothing but love. You declare that you are our God and we your people. Thus your commitment to watch over us, granting us all we need to have life in all its abundance, enabling us to live in joy and love for you and for one another. Thank you that your love embraces us all, saint and sinner. Thank you that even as we declare ourselves unworthy of your love, you still reach out to us, seeking us like the shepherd searching for the lost sheep, like the father waiting for his prodigal son. Jesus Christ, you are the ultimate expression of the love of God for us. For God loved us so much that God, God gave you to us, that whosoever believes in you should not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you that you came to live among us and for us. Thank you that you died, that we may never die. Thank you that because you live, our lives have meaning and we can face whatever challenges come to us. You have the courage to face the cross. May we too have the courage, not to turn away from suffering, but to face it in your strength. Through your example, we are no longer victims, but victors over all that brings us pain. Jesus, we Spirit, we thank you for your presence and work among us, for creating fellowship within the church, for sanctifying us and helping us to live gospel-inspired lives in the world and revealing the holy things of Christ to us. And so in your enabling power, we offer ourselves to be a living sacrifice for worship and service, and this to the glory of God. Let us together confess our sins to God. Almighty God, creator of all things, we confess that we have sinned against you and against one another in thought and word and deed. We have done what is evil in your sight and elected to do the good you require us to do. We have sinned through our own ignorance, our weakness, and through our deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and depend of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, forgive us all that is past, and grant us to live as forgiving people in newness of life and to the glory of your name. Amen. Listen to the good news. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear then the word of grace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thus we are bold to pray the prayer Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. <laughs> 
Sunday school starting today. So can we give them a moment to leave and to go? We're not kicking you out, okay? We're just asking you to go and enjoy Sunday school and, and teaching on the other side. Okay. Is that okay, children? Is that okay? This is a yes or this is a no? Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Let's bless the children. Let me... Amen. Amen. Oh, there's so many. I think members of this congregation are very obedient. When God told, told us to multiply, You've done a lot of multiplication here, people. <laughs> God bless you for the gift of children among us. They are a blessing to us. Just, just want to check. There were quite a number of metric students last year in this church. How have they done? Does anybody know? Kind of the big picture, how have they done? They've done well. Okay, thank you. And and I know some of, I know most of them were going to university somewhere uh, outside of Pretoria and various other places. Just remind your children that when they go to university, the first thing they need to look for at campus is what is called MethSOC, the Methodist Students Society. That's the first place. The second place they need to look for is the nearest Methodist church especially if you can walk to the church. Uh, that is the second thing. And, and then the rest is that they must just, must just stay safe and do what we send them to university to do. Remind them that they must not waste our money. Even the bursaries they have is not their money. Somebody else's money. So they, they mustn't waste our money and give us grief. But we thank God for them. Hear the word of, from the prophet Micah, chapter 6. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a case against his people. He's lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. My people, remember what Barak, king of Moab, plotted and what Balaam, 
son of Beor, answered, Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does God, what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And then from the epistle, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians chapter 1, and you read from verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. The weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Here ends the readings of the word of God. This is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. And now we hand over to the stewards to lead us with the notices and any other information we need. I think the steward on duty um, went out to take care of the baby. But leadership is not leaving all the work to one person. It is about others getting up to stand in the gap. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning, congregation. Um, just like we just said, it's not, I'm not there to work on duty. We just went out on call of nature. I don't think the child is giving her any sort of time. So I will take over. Uh, any birthdays that might have taken place? Birthdays, anniversaries? I don't know. Ah, birthday. There's a birthday. There's a birthday. Anniversary. Anniversary. How many years? 15 years. Thank you, Papa. Congratulations to you. Um, good morning, all. Um, Apologies for that. <laughs> so, um, notices, confirmation, 
uh, parents interested to enroll their children for the 2023 confirmation class, please collect your forms from the steward on duty or on the trolley outside in the outside the church. And then uh, the young adults will resume today uh, in the lounge of the mission at house day. So the young adults is uh, from ages 19 until 30. They are welcome to join the, they call themselves the Young Christian Movement. Uh, parents, if, you, if, if your kids are still sitting there, not your kids, the young adults, the sitting at home, please let them know that the YCN has resumed. For any information, please talk to me, Hazel, and my cell number is there. Second hand sale. Next Saturday will be our first second hand sale for 2023. Please bring unwanted usable items that we can sell. Bring it to the office or contact Abwe Mulutsi. The cell number is there. We also, we ask for willing strong hands to come and assist on the sale with tables and getting stock out of the mission house in the morning. Also remember that the car guard are watching our cars outside. And also for pastoral needs, ministries and visitation, Contact Reverend Berekon Cafe, cell number is there. Sonia on his cell number. The church office, the number is there. Office hours are from 9 until 2 p.m. If anyone needs prayer after the service, feel free to come on the rail, either in front or in the valley, in there, and someone will come in and assist you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and the car guard, you don't just remember him. There's a, there's a container at the door. He, he, he watches our car so that we may give him something uh, just for, uh, for him to, to earn a little bit of money. So please, when you leave, don't forget to do it. It's time to give now and we bring our gifts and our tithes uh, for the work of God.
and a blessing from you that we are able to bring these offerings and gifts to this place that they may be used and employed to spread your word, to offer your love and give support to those in need. We acknowledge that these are not our gifts, these are not our possessions, but they come from you as a trust to us. We use them wherever you need us to use them. Grant your blessing upon us as we offer not these gifts of money only, but our knowledge, our skills, and all that we are and all that we have. To the glory of your name. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <coughs> we now join in singing together the the hymn, Thou whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight. They are so. Thou almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight. Yet us we humbly pray and with Let's not explore your sweet let there be light. When our graves are long, love our people are long. came to him and he began to teach. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. 
rejoice and be glad, because your great reward, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here ends the word of God. Thanks be to God. May I greet you again in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, my Lord and your Lord, my Savior and your Savior. There is, there is none like him. And if you have found anyone better than this Lord, please tell me so that I can worship that one. But for now, we have faith. And I don't think that ever has been, I don't think there is, and there ever will be one like him. So go search, and if you find him, tell me, but I can guarantee you, you're never going to succeed, because he is the, the only Lord and Savior of our souls. Thank you for welcoming me back to this place. Somebody came up to me and said to me, I'm <laughs> And I said, so it's good to be humble Zobuya all the time, but it's good to be back here and to see all of you and the Lord has kept you and the Lord has continued to bless us as we worship here. We, 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 we know that you have a new minister, young, vibrant, and growing still. He was ordained last year, so after six years of of training, Methodists, Methodists do this thing. They train ministers for a long, long time. And by the time you get to the end of your training, you can't get up to spend too much time in training. And so uh, we thank God for Pereko and we pray that you will support him, give him as much support as he needs and that as he ministers to us, so will he grow. And so will we also grow under his ministry. The New Testament passage, the gospel passage we have read, is the beginning of the, the famous sermon Jesus preached, which is called the Sermon on the Mount. The words of Jesus spoken in this sermon are well known by most of us. Many of us learned the same about the Sermon on the Mount at Sunday school or at school where religious education was still part of the school system. There is no reason why it is called the Sermon on the Mount except that Jesus gave his teaching on, from the mountainside. We read from the passage that when Jesus saw the cows, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. Note that Matthew tells us that before Jesus began teaching, he sat down. This is important information from Matthew to indicate the significance of what Jesus was about to teach. He sat down. In Jesus' time and even today, Rabbis do not stand when delivering important and formal teaching. They sit down. It is something like at university where you have the professor's chair. It symbolizes the professor sitting there and teaching. It is something like in Catholic churches and Anglican churches where the bishop speaks, as they say, ex cathedra, from his chair. And so sitting on Jesus sitting down, send a message out to people that I'm about to say, to speak to you about important things. I'm about to give you an important message. In giving this message, then Matthew wants to inform us or call us to attention to what Jesus is about to teach. He, he, he was teaching mainly his disciples because Matthew also says the disciples came to him. But we know that there were crowds following him. 
And he says, on seeing the cows, he went up to the mountainside. And so while the teaching was focused mainly on his disciples, it also included anyone who could hear. Because you see, the word of God can never exclude people. We can never say to people, no, this is a private thing. Please don't, don't come and go home. It includes all people, saint and sinner. The gospel includes even you and me. Another interesting point here is to realize how much time Jesus spent on the mountain side or the hillsides or on top of mountains. And how many times he did some, something extraordinary on those mountains or mountain sides. Here are a few examples. He fed the 5,000 on the mountain side. In fact, it was more than 5,000 people. The Bible says there were 5,000 people, but we know there were 5,001 because there was a boy there who offered bread and fish. And we also know that Jesus had women who followed him. The Bible says there were 5,000 men, but it was actually much more than 5,000. So he fed that multitude on the mountainside. His transfiguration happened on the mountain where the glory of God was manifest through him, witnessed by the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, to the point that Peter said, Lord, it is good to be here. Let us build three, three tents. Let us build three structures here. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, because there appeared to them Moses and Elijah too. Peter was so confused on that day. I think when you encounter the glory of God, there's a bit of confusion that happens to us, doesn't it? And Peter was confused. There was Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Peter, James, and John. There were six of them. But Peter says, let us build three shacks. He, he couldn't quite count at that time. That's what God does to us sometimes. God, uh, Peter was, was from Shai Dingdo. But that happened on the mountainside, the glory of God. We, we, the, the, the most amazing thing that happened was on Mount Golgotha, the place where great pain and suffering happened to Jesus. But the benefit of it all was that through him and through that act, our sins were forgiven. When he was taken up to heaven on the ascension day, that happened from a mountain. He took them up to the mountain. And we are told often that Jesus went to the mountain to pray, seeking a place of quiet and solitude where he could commune and communicate with God. So even going up to the mountainside said to all who were present, there's something important that's going to happen here. And for many people, the passage we read from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12, that is the Sermon on the Mount. But in truth, the Sermon on the Mount is contained in chapters 5 to 7 of the Gospel according to Matthew. So what we have read today is actually called the Beatitudes. What is a Beatitude? Or what are Beatitudes? The word Beatitude is translated from, from Latin, meaning blessings. So this part of the Sermon on the Mount could also be called the blessings of Jesus. Jesus then begins his sermon by teaching what we have come to know as the blessings or the Beatitudes. It must have been strange and even shocking for the crowds to hear the words Jesus spoke to them on that day. He seemed to have things upside down. What do they say in Africans? Honor the poor. Dear Mekar. He seemed to have things dear Mekar a bit. He seems to have been confused and misunderstood the meaning of blessings and being blessed. Usually we feel blessed when we have an abundance of things, don't we? We feel blessed when we have an abundance of, of clothes in our, in our closets, when we have an abundance for ladies of shoes somewhere packed in, 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 in the house, when we, have an, when we have money in the bank, when we have money in our pockets, we feel blessed, don't we? We, we say we are blessed. Nobody will put a bumper sticker on their old score score that's about to die on the road. I am blessed. But have you seen those bumper stickers? They are put on big cars, on smart cars. 
That is blessing. But Jesus says, blessed are the poor. We are blessed when we are happy, not when we mourn. When we mourn, we are in trouble, we are hurting, we are in pain. Usually, when we are gentle, gentleness is not seen as a blessing. When we are gentle, people tend to take advantage of us. But Jesus says, even the gentle are blessed. What did Jesus mean? What was Jesus teaching on that day? Because what he seemed, what his teaching seems to be counterintuitive. Jesus seems to be throwing out everything we know and we believe about life and blessings. What we see happening in the world today is that the people who seem to be blessed are those who are strong, those who are proud, those who don't care about righteousness, those who are merciless, those who are harsh, imposing, demanding, who are, I found this wonderful word, who are impervious. Now, impervious means unable to be affected by anything. An impervious person is unable to be affected by a crying child. You see, Mrs. Barrero is not impervious. That child was crying and she's gone there and she's a granny, you see. She's taken the child and hold, holds her and the child is quiet now. Now that's the other side. Impervious people will just sit there and watch and listen and get annoyed with the child crying and don't do anything. Impervious people will see someone in pain and don't care. They, don't, they won't even lift a finger to help. But Jesus says, God's blessings come to the most unlikely people. God's blessings come to the poor in spirit, to those who mourn, to those who are meek, to those who are righteous, to those who are merciful, those who are pure in heart, peacemakers, and those who are persecuted and insulted. Who are these people Jesus is talking about? I need to say first of all that this, these 12 chapters in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, these 12 verses, need time. And so what, what I'm going to do today is just to, to whet your appetite. You need to go back and find other sources and read through and really get into, into this passage. So I'm just going to give you snippets and whet your appetite so that you can go and search. Uh, uh, you can go to Google and search, but sometimes Google is not the best professor in the world. But it helps. So who are the people Jesus is talking about? Let's go through these blessings one by one. And if it's now 12 past 10, and we're supposed to stop at quarter past 10, am I right? So Jesus will not mind if I take 10 more minutes of the service. And I hope you won't mind if we take 10 minutes more of the service. Is that okay? Thank you. But I'll watch you, and when you begin to fall asleep, I'll stop. So let's begin with Jesus saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When people read this passage, they focus on the word poor, and they think Jesus means poverty or lack of wealth. But Jesus is saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit means that we recognize our complete spiritual, physical helplessness. The poor in spirit realize that they cannot rely on themselves, but rely on God, who continues to shower them with blessings, even sometimes when we do not deserve them. It means that when we open our eyes in the morning, we do so in, with deep gratitude and wonder and amazement at how we were able to sleep through the night and still rise alive and well. It means accepting our complete poverty before God, poverty of strength and knowledge and wisdom before God. It means we, we completely recognize that whatever it is we do, whatever it is we have done, comes from God. And our poverty in spirit is often not to is often to recognize that indeed we are poor. We depend on God. And when we recognize that, when we recognize that, God will continue to say, You belong 
For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You belong. In fact, you don't belong to the kingdom of heaven. Matthew says, Jesus said, For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So you don't belong. It is yours. Do you get it? It is yours. You don't, you, you are the, you are the, the oh, what is on what do I hear the Sunday? Who, who, who? No, no, no. The landlord. You are a landlord in the, you own the kingdom. You, the kingdom of heaven is part of your legacy. You don't just belong there. You did not come into the kingdom of heaven through a passport. It belong, God has given it to you and says, this is yours. You're a child of the kingdom of heaven. You belong there. And if you want to translate it again, you, 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 you're a child of God. So you're a child of the king. What makes it, what is a child of a king? You are a prince and princess in heaven. You are royalty, not just any, any human being. You are royal in the face of God. Thank you, Mama Rui, for not being impervious. You see, our world admires self-reliance and total independence from anything, even from God. We are told that we are good enough, smart enough, strong enough, and able to be completely self-sufficient. It is good for everyone to hear that, that we are good enough, smart enough, and to be self-sufficient. But the one thing we need to remember also is that all of that we tell people they are, all of what we tell our children that they are, when we send them to university and say, you are smart enough, you'll make it. We've got to remember also that it is not enough just to tell them that you are good, but it is always important to tell them you are good because God has given you that goodness, that God has given you that intelligence because if we rely on ourselves and not rely on God. Our lives would be meaningless. And then Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Our culture tells us to be proud of who we are and proud of our actions. Our culture says, you are who you are and you are okay, be proud of it. Our world tells us that our actions are always right, but Jesus says that we should not be proud of who we are and not proud of, of our actions. Those who mourn are they that are aware of their weaknesses, their sins, their blind spots, and are in grief because they have disappointed God. I have a confession to make. I disappointed God today on my way to church. At a traffic light, there was a young a little boy leading a blind man towards me. And I had my window open, enjoying my music. And on Sunday, I enjoy classical music because it just gets me in the mood of worship. And so I was, and they, they came to the window, hello, and I got a bit irritated, you see, because that was the time when the hallelujah chorus comes up. I got it quite annoyed. And I didn't have time to find money in my pocket. In fact, I didn't ask my wife to give me money to leave. <laughs> so I, I got a bit annoyed. And got a bit judgmental to say, where do these people come from? They're all over the place. Every robot you find them, where do they come from? I became judgmental. And I think I disappointed God at that time. Because there was no compassion, no mercy, no kindness that I showed. And as I drove away, I, remind, I remembered that I had disappointed God. Someone in need didn't get help. I could even have said to them, I'm sorry today, Mama didn't give me money even to, to offer a church, but I didn't. And we all do that, don't we? I know I'm not alone in this thing. <laughs> when, we've gone to, when we've gone to a few malls and driven to three or four malls and you still get the same girl says, reverse, they don't have a driver's license, number one, but they tell you to reverse, they tell you how to drive. We get annoyed, don't we? But those who, who mourn are people who recognize 
deep down in their hearts that we disappoint God so many times. They are like a child who knows how much the parents love him or her, and when they've done something wrong and see the grief they caused their parents, they can only say to themselves, how could I cause my parents such grief? Something came to my mind that sometimes when our children have done something wrong, they go and lock themselves in their rooms, don't they? They lock, and sometimes we say, there, there he is now, there she is, locking herself in the room. That's how bad this child is. But don't, maybe, maybe the child is just going away to mourn and to grieve. And they keep saying, how could I disappoint my parents? So maybe they're not a bad child, they're just finding time to grieve. So all you need to do as a parent is to go out there and please keep a spare key to your children's bedrooms because they lock their rooms. And if you want to know how to take a key out of the door on the other side, talk to me after church. <laughs> but go there, open the door, and go and just say to your child, you may have done wrong, but I still love you. And give them a hug. Because that's exactly what God has done to us. When we have wrong, when we mourn and grieve for our sins and the wrong things we've done, God comes wide open arms to embrace us and to say, I still love you. Love you. I loved you from the day you were born. I loved you 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years ago when I sent my son to die for you. Accept my embrace. Blessed are those who mourn. When you grieve for the pain you caused God, God comes not to punish to bless you and to forgive. Have you sinned against God in any way? Are you hurting because of what you have done to God and to other people? Can I offer you the love of God today? God will embrace you and not judge you. God will heal you and not break you. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. In the modern world, meekness carries with it an idea of subservience, of spinelessness maybe. It paints a picture of a submissive person, timid, a creature who allows others to walk roughshod over them. It paints a picture of someone who allows themselves to be a doormat for people to walk over. But here in the, in the New Testament, the word meek is the same word used for an animal, a strong animal that has been domesticated and trained to obey the commands of its master. Picture a horse. A horse is 10 times bigger than you, but it, is, it allows you to ride it and control it. A horse can, can refuse to be controlled. The horse can throw you off its back and kick you and, and hurt you. But your horse restrains itself and allows you to take control, small and weak though you are. Imagine, I, I'm always amazed at the picture of a camel. Camels are, are tall animals, and in order for someone to ride on it and go wherever they need to go, the camel gets on its knees first and allows you to climb on it and takes you where you are. That is a symbol of meekness. It is, meekness is when someone bows down and goes down to the level of someone in need, someone, a weaker person, not to stay there with them, but to lift them up and rise with them and take them wherever they need to be. A meek person is one who knows that I am strong, but I'm not going to use my strength oppress others, but I'm going to use my strength to give, to strengthen other people. A meek person is one who says, I have power, but I'm not going to use my power to abuse others, but I'm going to use it in order to build others up. Blessed are the meek, because they do what Jesus has done. He came down to earth in order to lift us up. 
and pay the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice for us. It is meekness, Jesus says, that will help us inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Are you still with me? You're still not dozing off in my life. You're still awake. Okay. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness is defined as the quality of being morally right. Not morally correct, morally right. Especially in terms of how God would like us to live. Every one of us know how far we fall short of God's commands and God's desire for us to live in accordance with God's will. And it hurts to know that somehow we miss the mark. At communion, when we, before we have communion, we pray this prayer, that Lord, we come to your table trusting in your mercy and not in any goodness of our own. But it is your nature always to forgive and on that we depend. And so when we pray the prayer, we say to God, Lord, we, 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 we hunger, we are thirsty for your righteousness. We are not worthy, but we need you to make us worthy. When we confess our weakness, God gives us strength. When we confess our sinfulness, God forgives our sins. When we confess our brokenness, God restores us. God's promise is that whatever it is for which you hunger, I will fill you. God's plan for you is for you to be satisfied. Did Jesus not say, I have come that they may have life and life in all its abundance? That is God's purpose for your life. Friends, God's purpose for your life is when you hunger and thirst for God, God comes and fills you. God's purpose for your life is for you to rejoice and be glad and celebrate life. God's so often, so often when we are in trouble, when we are in need, when we, we have issues, don't we focus so many times on our, on our issues? And sometimes there may be maybe one issue, but you say to someone, oh, I have so many issues. And when you tell me about them, there's only one. We focus so much on the trouble. We focus so much on the clouds above, the dark clouds above our heads. And we forget that beyond those clouds, the sun still shines. When I have, I have trouble, I have a problem with whatever, I focus on them and maybe, maybe it's important just to stop and look at your hand. And, oh, I've got two hands. I've got ten fingers. I've got two eyes. I've got two ears. I've got, I've got tattoo in my car that brought me to church. I come from a, the safety of a house. I've got shoes on my feet. I've got clothes on my back. One issue will not make me less than what God intends me to be. Because God has already blessed you. That issue has just kind of crept into your life. But God has already blessed you. Blessed you. That is what prompted one person to write a hymn. Come to blessings, name them one by one. See what God has done for you. Are you counting your blessings right now? Are you, are you counting your blessings? Think of those blessings that God has given you and thank God and see how. Oh, there's another song that says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of the earth shall go strangely dim because you have not turned your eyes towards the storm, you turn your eyes towards Jesus. I often remind people that you see, when you turn your eyes towards Jesus, it's like turning your face towards the sun. When you're facing the sun, when you, or whatever light, when you turn your face towards the light, where does your shadow go? Behind you. So when you turn, it's symbolic that when you turn your eyes towards the light of Christ, 
All the dark stuff is behind you. You don't see them. But when you turn your back on the light, all the dark stuff stands right before you. What do you choose? Are you turning towards Jesus or turning away from him? I recommend that you turn towards Jesus. I recommend that highly. Jesus then says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Our culture is about winning, isn't it? Don't show mercy. Be right, get it right, win. Get in the red race and win it by any means necessary. One of my friends reminds me that we, we, we get into the red race, we run the red race, and we sometimes win. But even when we win the red race, you still remain the right. So what's the point? <laughs> I'm convinced that many merciless people behave in that way because they themselves need mercy. Do you get me? Many people who act mercilessly, they themselves need mercy. Have you ever thought and wondered why that colleague of yours or that boss of yours, whoever it is, who has authority over you, is so ruthless? Is it because somewhere they've never learned or never received mercy from anyone? And so their default is on being merciless because they have existed and lived in a merciless world. Maybe you're the one who could change, who's going to change that person's, that person's life by showing them some mercy. People will push others down because they are afraid to be pushed down themselves. The only way people will know how important we are is when we treat others like dead, when we oppress them, when we make others weak in order for us to appear strong. The reason why people keep behaving that way. Someone said, dictators continue to, to, to live like that because they are people who ride around on tigers and they're afraid to dismount because they know that they've been riding this tiger and this tiger just waits for them to dismount so that it will gobble them up. Is this why people hold on to, are there any politicians here? Is this why people hold on to power so much? Is this why people have so many votes of no confidence and others who lose take others to court? Is it why they hold on to power even when their time is up? Is it why, oh, I'm getting into trouble here. Is it why when you look at, at the average age of our parliament, <laughs> is it why they refuse to get off? Because they've been riding on this tiger and the tiger is angry now. Sorry, if you're a politician, I don't mean you, you're a good Methodist, okay? I'm talking about the other politicians. But Jesus says, people in his kingdom are those who show mercy to others, and they too will receive mercy. Do you remember what, what Jesus said also about forgiveness? Jesus, when, when this man who owed his master a lot of money was forgiven his debt and he went out and demanded the others who owed him less to pay him. Jesus said, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. The Lord's prayer is also followed by the two verses which explain and underline the, the petition in the Lord's prayer. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And Jesus says, 
For if you forgive people their trespasses, your heavenly Father also will forgive you. But if you do not forgive them their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It's quite a scary message, this. So do you want God to have mercy on you? Then start giving other people mercy. Do you want God to forgive? Do I want God to forgive my sins? Then I should begin by forgiving others. And you know, forgiving someone else is not for that person's benefit. It's for my benefit. Look, if someone walks into the door and I hate them, I don't like them, I despise them, what happens? My blood pressure goes up. My heart begins to beat faster. I'm the one who gets, whose mouth gets dry. Nothing happens to that person who walks in. It's happening all to me. So I become a candidate for a heart attack simply because I've not forgiven someone. For help, some, help yourself, heal yourself, forgive someone, and save yourself from a heart attack. Because that person will live. And I'm the one who suffers. Blessed are the message. For they shall be given mercy. And then Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. This Jesus paints a picture of a person who is sincere in everything they do, a person who is not hypocritical. The word hypocrite came into the English language from the Greek word hypocrites, which really means an actor or a stage player. How often do we see people living like they're on a stage? How often do we see people trying to impress the world? Go to your Twitter account and read it and see how many people try to impress the world. The me, myself, and I again. Me, myself, and I. How many people live within a cycle of untruths and lies about themselves? You know, it's something to lie about other people, but to lie about, about themselves. They take selfies at Colonnade Mall, and they send it out and say, look, I was in London. But you know, one lie, as you know, you tell one lie, and you've got to tell another lie to cover the lie you spoke to told yesterday. And so people live in a cycle of untruths and of lies. And what today people say, fake people. And do you ever wonder, do you ever wonder why people will come to you for advice, even when they know you're not a psychologist? They'll come to you. Why? It is because maybe they've just seen you as a person who is pure in heart. When someone comes to you seeking your counsel, give thanks to God because they've recognized in you something of a pure heart. That you will not be a hypocrite, but that you have a pure heart. Give thanks to God for that because that is a blessing. Blessed are those who are pure in heart, says Jesus. People who, people can see through the fake stuff in our lives, you know, and they will not come to us, Christian people. Christian people, people can see the fake Christian. People can see the fake preacher. I hope I'm not in that category. People can see the stuff that are not true and real in us. Be the person who will be like a star that shines not only to light but to guide others. I think I'm going to stop with the peacemakers. The others will pick up some other time. I just don't want to wake you up. I want you to stay awake and leave here and go home. Otherwise you'll wake up and find the church empty. Blessed are the peacemakers, says Jesus.
for they will be called children of God. Who is a child of God? A child of God, of course, everyone is a child of God. Sin and sin are good and bad. We all are children of God. But there's a quality of a peacemaker that confirms that they are children of God. You know, in my language, people don't ask me, who are you, Umuba, anyway? They say, Umuwa, wa wa ba, wa ha ma. Do you get it? They're asking, who, to whom do you belong? Where is your origin? Where, what is your, what is the link? Because you see, when you say, you tell them who you are by pointing them to your origin, the link that gives you life, then people understand that whatever behavior you display is because it is not just simply your behavior, it is the behavior of a line of other people. So, children of God. You see, when, 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 when people do something wrong in our family, and I've been told that even in my youth, that this, you are not Undamboe, you are something else. And I, I find myself telling young people in my family now, because I'm, a, I'm, I'm an elder, so someone who, whose behavior is unlike God's behavior cannot claim to be a child of God. So we behave and we act in a manner that confirms that we are children of God. And one of those is about making peace. Now sometimes when we talk about peacemakers, we think of people who are schooled in conflict resolution, who are sent into places where people are in disagreement and, and try to reconcile people. No. Jesus is not talking about those. We're not talking about people who go and intervene somewhere. Jesus means peacemakers who are blessed are those who, when they have been hurt, when they have been despised, when they have been broken by others, will learn to make peace between themselves and the other people. This is not about other people out there. It's about you and me. There are a number of people that I struggled with in my life, and I'm sure you do too. But the blessing comes when you find a place in your heart to make peace with that person. I said earlier, you don't when you forgive someone, you don't, you don't need to go and tell them that I forgive you. Because you might be disappointed when they say, keep your forgiveness. And you'll be hurt more and more. When you forgive someone, it is your business with yourself and with God. You don't have to go to them. You don't have to phone them. You don't have to send them on a WhatsApp to say, look, I forgive you. God will forgive them. But you forgive because you want to make peace. And the blessing is that you're going to live in peace without the stuff that sits. It doesn't sit here, you know, the stuff that sits here. That makes you bend over and really makes you anger in there. But when you make peace with other people, hear what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And here's the thing, he writes, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. An ambassador is one who does not represent him or herself. He represents other people. The, I can't figure out, is it 
ambassador to South Africa, ambassador to whatever it is. But when I am an ambassador and stationed in the UK, I'm not, I'm not going to represent myself or my family. I'm going to represent South Africa and the values of my country. So when you are Christ's ambassador, you represent Jesus and the values of Jesus. And God has committed to us this ministry. So go out today and live as a representative of Jesus Christ. The truth of the matter is that we may make, we may, we may slip and fall. But friends, when you slip and fall as a Christian, and in the words of one of my friends too, who keeps reminding us that Christians will be knocked down, but Christians will never be knocked out. And that is the difference. The Christian will rise again in spite of being knocked down over and over again because your mission is to represent Christ who even when they, they, they nailed him to the cross, they killed him, they put him in a grave, they rolled the stone over the grave, but he rose again and lives forever. Go and be like Jesus, rise over and over again and tell the world that I do this not because of my strength and my power, but because of the blessings Jesus has given to me. Thanks be to God for the blessings of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Are, are you okay? Yes. You're still awake? Yes. Can I go home now? Yes. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. But we're going to conclude our service by singing, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my life and let it be church today. Thank you for being people of God today. But please don't tell your minister that I took a long, long time in the service. Otherwise, he won't invite me back here. So please don't tell him. It's just between you and me. And it's not recorded. So he's not, he's being recorded. Yeah. Also, he's found out already. <laughs> but let's bless one another.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.